Getting an internal combustion engine to work is pretty simple. You need fuel, compression, and spark. If it's not running, check all three of those and you'll figure out your problem. Getting an electric motor to run requires some different things. You need about 350 volts, probably some other stuff. I don't actually know. It's all a secret magic box. Is it even possible to know how one of these things work or is it beyond the comprehension of man? Who can say? I am just a simple mechanical engineer. When I take things apart and put them back together again, I expect them to work. But with electrical things, sometimes when you take them apart, the magic escapes. I had this totally reasonable and rational fear when I decided to take this sensitive piece of high voltage electronics, disassemble it into a hundred pieces, and then reassemble it in a different way, grafted to a 70 year old British car like some sort of horrific medical experiment. Will it work? I don't know. I do know actually, and so do you, it's in the title of the video, but I didn't know up until a few days ago. So travel back in time a few days and join me on this journey that might end in a running motor, but might also end in a huge battery fire. So I'm going to admit something here that I haven't mentioned before. I actually had this motor and battery running a few months ago. When I first got the controller and wired it all up, I tested it and spun the rear wheels. This was exciting, but I knew that I was going to have to repackage everything, and I was a little worried that it wouldn't survive the procedure. Nginx, the company that makes the controller that I'm using, specifically states that they make no guarantees the system will continue to work once it's disassembled, which is reasonable. What happens if I get it all wired back up and then nothing happens? I could check for fuel, spark, and compression, but I hope I don't find any of those. I got less worried about this after digging around on some forums and talking to some smart people. Not that I would know what was wrong if I encountered an error, but I'm starting to think that I can figure it out. I know a few people have used the Model 3 battery as a whole, and I know some people have taken the modules out and used those independently, but I haven't found anyone who has taken the Model 3 battery and reassembled the entire thing in a whole new package in a car. At least, I haven't found anybody who has detailed the process. So, maybe it works. Let's find out. Getting the modules installed in the car was not super easy, given the fact they are extremely long. I got the smaller battery, which has fewer cells, but Tesla doesn't really make them easier to repackage, they just remove the cells from the middle two rows, so the medium range and long range modules are the same size. Still, I managed to get them all packaged in the car, mostly within the existing frame with a slight frame modification, and lifting the body up about half of an inch off of the frame. This was all detailed in two previous videos, both linked below in the description. Also, in one of those videos, I talked about packaging the penthouse, which I'm now calling the outhouse, into the trunk up against the back of the rear seats. After exploring this a little further, I decided to move it to the floor of the trunk. I didn't initially want to do this because I thought it would be more out of the way up against the back of the seats, but that would have made it really hard to mount. The bottom has all of these cables coming out of it, and I would have had to offset it from the back of the seat to clear all that stuff, and then it's just sort of jutting out into the trunk a bunch. Also, I don't know that I'm going to use the trunk for anything, I'm not going on any road trips, and I will also have a frunk. Dismounting would have also put the coolant hose going to the battery electronics really high. It would have been the highest point in the system, so I would have had to modify it to add a bleeder to get air out. But if the system slowly degassed air bubbles, then they would collect air, so I'd have to periodically bleed out the air, or somehow fit a coolant reservoir and filler above the penthouse, way up in the trunk where it would be impossible to fill it. So I decided to just set it on the floor of the trunk. But this came with its own challenges. You see, the outhouse is just barely too wide for the trunk. The wheel wells are about an inch and a half too narrow to fit the outhouse, even if you cut the flanges off the sides. Now, the left side of the outhouse has an inch and a half of space that I could cut off. I could disassemble the case, chop a couple of inches off of this side, and weld a flange on to seal it off. But I decided to just modify the wheel wells. There is plenty of room for the tire, so I just needed to trim the flanges off the outhouse and bubble out these walls. The first part was easy, I just got the sheet metal shears and cut the flange off, then taped it up to keep it somewhat sealed. To modify the wheel wells, I measured and cut the inner fender, and then bent it out of the way. I actually cut this too much, I really should have just cut the bottom part and then a bit up the middle, then I could have used the chief engineer to carefully shape the metal to clear the outhouse case, but whatever. I got the metal bent and modified to clear the outhouse, then I just sort of tack welded it into place. 
I didn't really want to full weld this. For one, I didn't want to cut out a bunch of little strips and weld them all in. The metal on this Jag is pretty tough to weld, and I kind of need this to be sealed up watertight because the wheel is going to be throwing up water and dirt around. I could mostly weld it and then seal it up with some random adhesive I have lying around like I did with the transmission tunnel patch, but then I thought, why not just fiberglass it up? This is kind of the lazy way to do this, and I did it as lazily as possible. Lazy is not always bad. As an engineer, I'm all about efficiency, and sometimes there is a significant overlap between lazy and efficient. But I really did phone this one in. I could have bought some fiberglass from the local auto parts store, but then I also could just reach slightly to my left and pick up the carbon fiber that's just sitting in my garage. I also don't have a measuring cup to correctly measure the 3 to 1 ratio of epoxy, so I just eyeballed it using this old water bottle. Then I mixed it together in this trash can I had lying around, which I wiped mostly clean. Then I just cut out some squares and painted them on. I did put down some plastic sheeting to keep the drips off the floor and off the suspension. I cleaned up the area with a wire brush and got most of the dirt and rust off. Then I sprayed some Osfo on it to neutralize any rust left over. Then I wiped it down with some acetone. I put two layers on the outside and one on the inside, and then I did the same with the other side of the trunk. At some point, I'm going to clean up the rest of this wheel well and paint it with some of this 3M underbody coating. That should make it all blend together. After that was dry, I dropped the outhouse into place. Then all I needed to do was connect the wires. I had already crimped the connectors for the high voltage lines, so I just attached those to the post. I will need to redo these and shorten them to the appropriate length, but that comes later. I also needed to extend the wires for the pyro fuse, the shunt, and the BMS. With the repositioned outhouse, these were too short. The cables from the outhouse to the motor also needed to be extended. The motor and the outhouse are usually a lot closer together, so I bought an extra cable and spliced the two of them together to make one long cable. Before we get too much farther, it's probably a good idea to put the car on jack stands so it doesn't accidentally accelerate through my house. Also, before I get too far, I'll need to make a switch box. As I said before, the controller has wire inputs to switch the motor between park, reverse, neutral, and drive, but I need buttons for that. So I took an old plastic case I had, drilled some holes in it for buttons, wired up the buttons and an on-off switch, and installed it temporarily in the back of the car with the accelerator pedal. I need all four modules connected in series, and to do that, I need to connect the two on the right together and connect the two on the left together. I made little brackets to bolt these together. I'm really just connecting these modules together in the same orientation and basically in the same way that Tesla has, but it's still a little nerve wracking. I'm just waiting for sparks and fire. Speaking of, let me get this fire extinguisher that won't actually do anything. Maybe also a quick disconnect for my HV cables, just in case. Definitely all of this work needs to be done with the correct high voltage gloves. Then it was time to connect the 12 volt system. The high voltage battery needs the 12 volt system. It uses it to slowly ramp up the voltage before closing the contactors. That way you don't get a huge arc across the closing contactors. Remember, spark is good on an internal combustion engine, bad on electric vehicles. You probably also hear what sounds like a small electric motor running. That's the oil pump. The oil pump always has 12 volts running to it, but it also has communications wire going to the drive unit. The drive unit measures the temperature and requests the oil pump to run at a certain speed based on that temperature. When you flash the firmware on the drive unit, it stops being able to communicate with the oil pump. You also have to flash the firmware on the oil pump, otherwise it just runs in failsafe mode at 100% all the time. Nginext is supposed to remote in and fix the pump so it doesn't do that. That'll be nice, but for now, it's just spinning away. With the 12 volt connected and the modules connected, it's time to add the pyro fuse. This makes the whole system live. It completes the circuit so that there are now 350 volts between this post here and this post here. With everything wired up, it was time to get the motor spinning. I spent a good 20 minutes looking through my notes to figure out how to connect to the controller, which CAN bus messages to send, and how to send them. If you just get the battery controller, it has button inputs for this, but if you get the controller for the motor and the battery, you only get button inputs to switch the motor between park, reverse, neutral, and drive. So you have to connect a laptop to switch the battery between standby, charge, and drive. I'll have to build an Arduino that does that with some buttons. This is kind of annoying. They really should have added buttons for inputs for this. It would make the controller much nicer to use. Anyway, after sending the wrong message several times, I got it right, and I heard the unmistakable sound of the contactors closing. This means the battery is connected to the powertrain. After that, I just press the drive button to switch it into drive. This is supposed to require that the brake pedal be pressed, but it doesn't seem to need that. Seems kind of dangerous. 
Sending the drive signal gets the inverter ready to accept input from the accelerator pedal, but it also disengages the parking brake. This car doesn't have a mechanical parking lock like most cars, it just uses the parking brake. The documentation for this controller shows the parking brake output going to a couple of relays that send 12 volt and ground to the park brake motors to open them and then switches the polarity to close them. This doesn't work. The parking brakes on the Model 3 don't have any feedback, so you have to measure the current draw from the parking brake motor. Once the brakes are engaged, the current spikes. The Model 3 controls this through the body controller, which looks for that current spike to know when the brakes are engaged. The way that the Nginx wiring diagram is shown, it will just clamp the motor until that spike blows the fuse. So I'm gonna have to build a parking brake controller. I'll get into this more later when that time comes. For now, I just have a resettable fuse, which is not a great idea. Anyway, battery is in drive mode, parking brake disengaged. So I just have to press this accelerator pedal and... It works. I got brakes, I got a motor, yay! It's now all I need is steering and I can drive. But for the time being, I took out the pyro fuse because this whole high voltage battery makes me nervous. In fact, after this, I kept looking out the window every five minutes to make sure my garage wasn't on fire. I'm sure everything is fine, but it's all new, so it still makes me anxious. Like I said, all I need is steering, and for that I just need to make new tie rods, mount the column, which I'll need to remove the dash, and then reinforce the steering mount, weld up the I shaft, get a steering wheel, and wire up the powered column. But I also need to get the cooling system done, so I'll need to order a radiator, rerun the battery lines to the rear, uh, mount the reservoir and the brakes. pump. I gotta spin the NPT fittings and rebleed the brakes. I'll need to do a seat mount floor for, for the outhouse in the trunk. I gotta plug all the holes. I have the to outhouse rings. and rerun all the wires. I gotta shorten those HV cables I was talking about rerun earlier. Run the lines to the front for the accelerator and the brake cable. So I'm basically done. It used to be that you had to impress people to get people to watch your show. Now you just have to impress the algorithm. So do me a favor, hit that subscribe button. All hail the algorithm. <laughs>